my name is Grace Singling. I graduated from Talbot a couple years ago, and I currently work in the purchasing office with uh, the purchasing minions. Shout out to them. Um, I think I have a picture here up on the screen. Uh, <laughs> if it can be projected. Um, yeah, so I work in the lower level of Metzger in between IT and the men's bathroom. Uh, don't get us confused with either of those. Um, it's also known as the dungeon of Metzger since we don't get very much um, sunlight down there. Um, yeah, I think you can see a picture of my coworkers coming up at some point. Okay, maybe not. Oh, here we go. There they are, the purchasing minions. Yay, shout out to them. Um, so if you ever need to buy stuff, you can come down and visit us um, down there in the dungeon of Metzger. And in my free time, I really love listening to music, going to concerts, running around Disneyland, and collecting the minions from Despicable Me. I also write for a blog called The Two Cities, and I'm really interested in studying the theology and dynamics of shame, which is why I'm he I am here today. It's almost the end of the semester, and you all are probably pretty tired and stressed, or you're excited about Mock Rock tonight, woohoo! <laughs> Woo! Yeah, which I hear um, has some pretty cool performances. Some of you are probably in it. Um, I remember being an undergrad and all the fun things that happened on campus when I went to UCLA. And there were also so many events happening on campus. I loved UCLA, go Bruins. Um, but <laughs> it's a pretty different feel here at Biola. I remember the first time I came to Talbot, how cool it was that we actually prayed in class and that my professors actually cared for me since going to a large university like UCLA, I sometimes felt lost in the huge sea of people. Even though I know it can feel like a bubble here sometimes, we really do have a pretty sweet community as we are part of the same family in Christ. The community here at Biola has helped me through a lot of tough times. I'm sure you've all been through some hard stuff, whether it be the stress of school, figuring out what to do with your life, what you should major in, what kind of career you should go into. There are fights with your parents, trying to figure out relationships, whether this guy or girl is the right one for you. Hashtag, the struggle is for real. There are problems that we feel okay sharing with people, problems with homework or roommates, but then there are some struggles which we don't want others to find out about. We don't want people to see the dark places of our hearts. We feel ashamed to admit that we struggle with the secret sins like lust, addictions, greed, pride, and hatred. It's that feeling that we need to hide and cover the badness that we feel inside, which keeps us from being open and honest with others. It's shame that makes us not want others to truly see us. So, how does shame keep us from being known? Shame is the feeling that happens when I haven't studied very hard for a test because I was out with my friends at a concert late last night and so the temptation comes to look at someone else's paper. And then the teacher catches me looking over my friend's shoulder. I don't want her to look at me in the eye, so I look down, stare at my feet, avoid eye contact, because it's shameful for her to see me. I'm scared about the consequences, but I feel even worse because I know that I've done something wrong. And not only have I done something wrong, which can at times, uh, which, which feels bad inside, but I also feel like I am bad. So shame happens when we do something wrong, which can at times be a good thing to help us avoid doing bad things. 
Yet, this shame can also be a source of hiding and covering from God. It can keep us from truly receiving his love and forgiveness. There can also be an excess and toxic form of shame that makes us feel unwanted and not good enough. We even wonder if we're good enough to receive the love God has for us. Guilt and shame are related, but they're also different. While guilt deals more with a feeling of failure for doing something wrong as based on an action, shame deals with our own sense of badness or feeling of unwantedness based on who we are. Guilt says, I've done something something bad, while shame says, I am bad. This internal badness makes us want to hide and cover from God and others. Just as Adam and Eve tried to hide their nakedness from God once they sinned, we also try to hide our sins and our faults. Shame also deals with our relationships with others. It's that feeling that happens when we're not picked to be on the sports team we wanted to be on or that time when our friends left us out of something fun that was happening, or that time when we didn't get accepted into the school we wanted to get into, or that time when that guy or girl we liked didn't like us back. We feel rejected, not good enough, unworthy, unloved. In the Asian culture, it's about saving face or keeping up appearances to not bring shame or dishonor to the family and community. We also see the theme of shame all throughout the Bible. While we as Westerners often focus on the language of guilt, the Bible actually uses shame language much more frequently than guilt language. The Hebrew word for shame is found repeatedly in the Old Testament 128 times to be exact, which suggests that it plays a significant role in the unfolding story of God's people. A person's identity lied in the role they played in society. Since it was a group-oriented culture, belonging to the group and being an honorable member of the group was vital for a person to thrive in the community. Shame brought about a sense of being cut off from the group. Shame can keep us from being truly known by others because we feel like we need to play roles around other people. We put on masks, hiding behind them, scared and fearful of what others may say when they see who we really are inside. We fear that they won't love us or accept us when they see the broken, and ugly parts of ourselves. Yet, Jesus turns shame on its head as he accepts and loves the outcast and marginalized. Even from his lineage, Jesus came from a line associated with those women who were considered shameful. There was scandal seen around the conception of Jesus as Mary was seen as being with child even before she was married to Joseph. In this way, even his conception and birth would be seen as shameful in this society. Throughout his life, Jesus spends time with the outcast, the sinners, and marginalized. He associates with the lowly. He accepts people on the fringes. He calls Matthew the tax collector as one of his disciples. Jesus touches a leper and heals him. He allows a sinful woman to anoint his feet with her hair. He talks with the Samaritan woman and offers her living water. He gives forgiveness, freedom to a woman caught in adultery. Through Jesus' death, he truly transforms shame. Being wrongly accused, arrested, and put on trial by the religious authorities was shameful. Christ was humiliated as he was beaten and stripped of his clothing. Crucifixion was one of the most shameful ways to die, and Jesus was mocked as they put a crown of thorns on his head. 
Jesus suffered the fullness of our shame on the cross when he experiences full abandonment from the presence of the Father, and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet, Jesus also makes the place of greatest shame the place of greatest honor. When Jesus cries out, it is finished, he gains victory over eternal death. Through the resurrection, Jesus defeats death and the cross becomes a place of honor. As Hebrew 12, two says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus despised shame on the cross and gains honor at the right hand of God. We can live in the truth and power of Jesus' victory. As Jesus has overcome shame, he brings us into full acceptance with God as we are now beloved children of God. We can be fully known as we are by God since he loves us, loves us as his children. We can approach his throne with boldness and without fear because of Christ and because he has gained victory over shame. Since we have our Abba Father, we can reach out and ask God to hold us, to be near us, just like a little kid reaches out and just wants to be held by her daddy. We are also now part of the family of God, and we are part of this family together. Jesus doesn't leave us alone to do life by ourselves, but he invites us to live in community with each other, to experience his love and grace in tangible ways through people. It's exciting to know that we do have power over shame through Christ, but I know that there's still the struggle with shame in this life before heaven, and that's why we need each other. This is where I want to invite you to enter into honest conversation with God, because Jesus truly understands shame and suffering and wants to walk with you in it. He doesn't leave you alone, and there are others here who also want to walk with you through your doubts and your struggles, through the questioning, through the pain. I invite you to ask God to meet you wherever you're at and let him know how you're feeling, even if he feels distant and far away. So just take a moment to reflect on areas where you feel ashamed to let people see you. Reflect on the love of God and his abundant grace. Know that you are loved. And so I ask you to reflect in what areas of my life am I scared to show God and to others? A reason that I'm drawn to studying the theology of shame is the reality of my struggle with it in my own life. In seeing the ways Jesus enters into shame and transforms it, bringing love and acceptance to replace shame, I find freedom in the midst of it. Since mental illness is something that is often taboo in many churches and Christian circles, I'm encouraged by others who have shared honestly about their struggles. I've seen the healing power of being open to others about my own struggles to know that I am not alone. So I'm going to share my own struggle with shame and depression. To give some background information about myself, my parents were born and raised in the Philippines. They're here today, Yeah, came here in the 70s, and I was born in Los Angeles. I was raised in a Christian home. My parents were both believers, and so by the time I was six, I had already accepted Jesus in my heart and prayed the sinner's prayer. I grew up going to church and learning about God and Jesus and how we need to trust and obey Jesus since he was the only way to heaven, and I was terrified of going to hell. 
I grew up going to a small Filipino church in downtown Los Angeles, and they were like my family. I was in my first church musical at the wee age of three, and I was fully involved in all the various church activities like Sunday school and Awana. I went to summer camps in junior high and high school and rededicated my life to Christ numerous times. I was the good Christian girl, really involved in church and youth group, church choir, played the piano for praise team, went on missions, and I did all the right things because I thought that these things would make God love me. I was also the nice, friendly, overachieving Asian girl who excelled in academics and was a straight A student. And yet, there was still something inside of me that at times felt deep sadness, sadness and loneliness that didn't go away, even though I knew all the right answers that God loved me in my head. There were times where I felt this intense pressure to do well and to be perfect, to not let my guard down, to not disappoint my family, to not disappoint God. And I felt like I was a hamster, running and running around in this wheel that didn't go anywhere. I was tired, exhausted, and lonely. Sometimes I wished that I could just escape this life, to just end it would be a relief. I was depressed, even though I didn't want to call it that. There was too much shame to say that I was depressed. A good Christian Filipina wasn't supposed to be depressed. I never had an actual plan to commit suicide, but there were fleeting moments where I thought suicide may be a way out. As a Filipina with a happy, laid-back kind of culture, I often mask the loneliness I felt inside with a smile and laughter. While the majority of people around me had no idea, thankfully, I had a few close friends who encouraged me through this period in my life, so I made it through. Fast forward to my second year in seminary, and after a traumatic event, these thoughts came back. Really? I thought I was past this. I'm in seminary. I'm supposed to be spiritually mature. I thought depression was something I already found victory over. Yet, here I am again. I remember one time when I was quite ready to explode, I scheduled an emergency meeting with my spiritual director, and in the midst of having thoughts of wanting to hurt myself, she helped me see that I wasn't alone, that Jesus understood anger, grief, betrayal, and that he met me in the midst of all of these emotions. During this season, I was surrounded by an amazing community of people who loved God and were trained to care for others. I knew I needed to ask for help, and I'm so grateful for all the resources that were available at Biola to receive the help that I needed. There was so much healing in allowing myself to be seen, even in the broken state that I was in, to allow others to care for me. From spiritual direction, counseling, and the community at Talbot, people helped me understand God's love and grace in ways I had never experienced before. During times when I felt so unlovable and forsaken by God, my community pointed me to the truth that God loved me and cared for me, that it was nothing I could earn or achieve. I see how God spoke to me through his word in reminding me that nothing can separate me from his love, as it says in Romans 8, 38, 39. And he also used the family of God to speak words of truth and love to me. While the dark thoughts of depression tried to isolate me, tried to tell me that I was alone, and that no one understood this pain, 
these dear friends would remind me of God's love and their love for me. While professional help in therapy has also been one of the ways God has used to bring much healing in my life, I am grateful for all the different relationships that he has given to bring about this healing. These people have shown me Jesus in an incarnational way through their love and care for me. And I am so grateful for their encouragement and support. So I want to encourage you today, wherever you're at with God, whatever you're feeling, you are not alone. You may think, oh, Grace is just another one of those chapel speakers. She doesn't really know what I'm feeling inside. And you know, I may not, but God does. And I know that he truly loves and cares for all of you. And you are part of this community at Biola and there are people here who want to help you, whether it be a friend or mentor or counselor. There are so many resources available on campus, from spiritual direction to student development to residence life, your professors, staff people like me, the Biola Counseling Center. There are so many places where you can get help. Ask God to give you courage to ask for help and allow yourself to receive the help and healing that you need from God and from others. You are so beloved and cherished. You are not alone. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.